Pick a game, any game. Google the soundtrack and you'll find a massively upvoted YouTube video full of thousands of people nostalgically reminiscing about it and their experiences within the game. It's evident that music is a powerful part of any experience. Most of my nostalgic memories have an accompanying tune. Is it any wonder that my favourite games also have the best songs? The real question is, do I like it because the music is good or because I loved the game and grew to also love the music? Take my dad's songs. As a child, I heard them all hundreds of times. There are a few that quickly became favourites. Sinkabonk, the song from Going Low and CSGO, wasn't one of them. And yet, since I've included it in the series so many times, it's grown on me to the point where it's probably my favourite. Anyway, the point is that music is important. When I first made games, my hands were tied. I only had the pre-made MIDI files from Click and Play and the Games Factory to work with. Luckily, there were some decent ones which I used to death, since making my own didn't even register as a possibility. Perhaps it was bitter memories of me failing with the music maker on SDOS Basic on the Atari that had shattered my confidence. Which is why it was such a big deal when somebody else would make the music for us. I collaborated with my friend, Tommy TTK, on some of the bigger games that we worked on. In 2003, for Christmas Combat, my dad wrote a couple of MIDI files, but they had large pauses at the beginning and we eventually opted for Street Fighter songs instead. Sorry, Dad. But for Santa's Atlas in 2007, we needed more. I think that we posted on Daily Click, asking for some help and somebody replied, saying that he could write some Christmassy music for us. We kept ourselves busy developing the title, and when he finally showed us the song that he had written, well, here's what it was like. It wasn't good. But he said that it was just an early version and that he could do better. He was so enthusiastic. We gave him the benefit of the doubt, some pointers in the right direction, and he got back to us with another version a few days later. He was so nice, we didn't want to say anything bad. We complimented him and the web of lies deepened. However, with the game coming along nicely, we knew that the music would let us down. Tom and I discussed it and decided that we couldn't use his music. It was very, very awkward to tell this lovely, enthusiastic man who was making music for us out of the goodness of his heart. We began talking to him, to which he replied with how much fun he was having making music for us. We dropped the bombshell that we didn't want to use his music. And he said that he didn't mind and he was thankful for us encouraging him to start writing songs again in the first place. Such a nice guy, I wanted to hug him. But Santa's Atmos still needed music, and Tom got his brother to write some. He was incredible and soon delivered six epic tracks that blew every other track we could have used out of the water. He wrote a world map one that he said sounded so depressing it would make players want to kill themselves, so it became the game over screen and served its purpose well. The two battle tunes were the strongest and I listened to them on repeat while working on the game itself. It helped me to complete the project. Even now I listen to them and they remind me of everything that went on during that cold December month. A few years later he wrote some more music for another game of ours called Spellings. The game didn't do justice to the wonderful tracks he wrote for them. I can't tell you how refreshing it is to work with somebody so capable that you know they're not just going to be able to do their role but will somehow do better than you could have hoped for. Thank you David. One day I will make a game that does your songs justice. I never thought that I'd be able to write my own music. With some things, like game design, I can see what I want to make in my head. I have never had such inspiration with music, and yet I did learn how to and got more enjoyment out of that than I ever managed with game design. It was mid-2008 and I was working on Jimmy's Unlikely Resurrection, a game kind of like N but not as good. It looked simple but it still took several weeks of hard work to make and by the end I was fond of it. It had a kick-ass boss sequence and quite a bit of character. Later on, during a holiday in 2012, I made a sequel, imaginatively known as Jimmy's Unlikely Resurrection 2. I kept the gameplay the same, but it had more polish, support for high scores, and could be exported in Flash. I released it on Newgrounds. A real-life friend of mine got competitive with it, and we spent the best part of a month shaving fractions of a second off our high scores. I'd load the game up every day to find previous records broken. I think it ended in a sort of tie. Since each level could be done in a matter of seconds, I raised the skill ceiling by grouping levels together. This was less annoying than having to submit a high score every couple of seconds and made it harder to get a perfect, unbeatable time since you'd have to flawlessly beat them all first time. Call it annoying or unfair, but everybody's in the same boat. 4 was the magic number of levels in a group and is something I carried forward with Destruction Darius, where I still believe it works well. I feel that with Jimmy's Unlikely Resurrection 2, I finally cracked what was required for a game to be simple yet addictive. It requires polish, intuitive controls and a simple goal that's very, very difficult to master. In the first game, Jimmy had to dodge exploding mines and a THING THAT LOOKS LIKE A DALEK that fires stuff out that then bounces across the level. 
With each shot, it fires itself backwards a bit, inevitably falling from a platform and exploding below, which became a gameplay feature in itself in later levels. For the second, I made the mines shoot towards the player once they were close enough. This made them butt-clenchingly terrifying. Both games had an end boss, though I still prefer the one in the first game. I wasn't happy with the response that the second one got on Newgrounds, so I decided to cash in on the work that I had invested by releasing expansions, each comprising of six new levels. I made Jimmy's Unlikely Resurrection 2 Episodes 1, 2 and 3. Each took just hours to make, but were received as well as the proper game was. I never did anything this devious again, but it taught me a lot. It made me realise why Valve went down the episodic route for Half-Life 2 and why DLC has become such a thang. It's a real dark side of the game making scene. If you look at the crap that's released on sites such as Newgrounds, you'll see that a lot of them seem to be the same game but with different backgrounds. At first I was like, who even plays these games? They must make them because they enjoy doing so. But it's not like that. The chances are they're made by somebody from China who lives off ad revenue scraps. To make money from Flash games, you either make a super hit or churn out hundreds of games from the same template. I feel sorry for them more than anything else since three episodes for me was boring enough. But Jimmy was more than just a cute little Flash game for me. It was also the first game that I wrote the music for. I guess I must have become bored of the pre-made MIDI files since I took a friend's advice and gave Fruity Loop Studio a go, not expecting any success. I spent half an hour arranging notes for a very unlikely instrument and ended with a song that I called Jimmy One. I was half expecting something similar to if you try improvising on a piano with no previous experience, but the result blew me away. It worked. Admittedly, it was simple, repetitive and boring, but it had a tune and didn't make me want to kill myself. Surely just a fluke, right? I started on my second song, imaginatively named Jimmy 2, and it was even better. Now I'm not saying that it's the next number one hit, or even a brilliant song, but it sounded like a song to me, and I loved it as one of my own. It had a tune, a chorus, and quite a catchy beat, and I proudly listened to it on repeat for months. I still like this one now, and don't think I could make something of a similar style again if I tried. But the important thing here is that, with no previous experience or idea of what I was making, I could write a song that I liked enough to proudly and endlessly listen to. Within a couple of months I had finished my first album, after another year, my second, and a few years after that, my third, and I proudly treasure each and every one of the tracks, many of which accompany a game or project that I was working on at the same time. When I started I was so driven and motivated by my unexpected success. After about the 10th I remember wondering how much better I'd be after the 20th, and so on. When I started, I expected to have churned out hundreds of them by the time I was 25. Of course, that didn't happen since each project began bloating, to the point where I simply didn't have the patience to invest months on a new track. In other words, once I had reached a standard high enough to be proud of, I lost interest. Just as I did with making games, maps and YouTube videos. For the love of God, stay simple. Speaking of which, with Jimmy's Unlikely Resurrection 2, I returned to basics. After having slaved away on my monster third album, with each song taking months to perfect, I returned to my roots and made Jimmy 3 and 4. I deliberately only spent an hour or so on each. The result? A simpler tune that went well with the game. It didn't have the instruments or complexity of my album songs, but it didn't stop me from loving them and listening to each hundreds of times. I added a dreamy sounding menu song as well. I love stuff like that. Heck, I loved making it so much that I even made another that was intended for Jimmy's Unlikely Resurrection 3, but instead ended up being used as the main menu for my game collection pack. You've probably already heard it. I even had an idea for an electronic, colourful sequel that used instruments similar to those in the Die Jimmy Die song in my third album. Jimmy has been a recurring character in both my games and my music, despite being such a simple little person. Still speaking of which, Death Giver. Remember this game? The one that I made in two hours? Well, it wasn't just a two hour game. It also contains the first and only song ever written by another Tom that I know. He is a smart guy, straight A's across the board kind of smart, without ever having to revise. With no prior knowledge, he picked up a music maker and churned out a MIDI file for the game. I included it in the game and left it at that. But then for Death Giver 2, I returned to that file and tried to revamp it. I replaced the MIDI sounds with proper samples and it's only then that I truly appreciated how good the song was. I mean, just compare it with my first attempt. He had tons of different instruments, all playing in beautiful harmony. I could take a piece from the original and quickly turn it into a song of its own. And I did. For Death Giver 2, I made many new tunes, all of which were originally based on the one that he wrote. Most I managed to write in the space of 10 or so minutes, and I loved doing so. I kind of wish that I had done more now. They all slotted into place perfectly. 
It took me so long to appreciate that original song that he jumped in and made something to a standard that took me months of practice to reach. When sat alone in my room, studying something that he casually wrote in minutes years earlier, I felt sheer admiration for his level of ability. He doesn't know that I've looked at his work. He didn't make it for recognition. In fact, he's probably forgotten all about it by now. He's moved on to other things while I'm still sat here remaking the song and following in his footsteps. Who knows what a mind like that would be capable of if he dedicated his life to just one thing. I see examples of this everywhere. The other Tom that I know, the one who worked with me on a number of games, is the same. We had a similar level of ability with the program all the way through school and college. The difference is that he didn't try. He just load it up occasionally and make something amazing. What do people want from life? Many want to be rich, or to have children, or to travel the world. But what I want is difficult to explain without sounding big-headed or full of myself. I've spent my life racing towards end goals that I'll never reach. I've seen others drop out from the same race to pursue other things, and I admire them, feeling that they've moved to greener pastures. I see others starting the same race as me, but far behind, and I admire them for having the excitement of discovering the things that I now take for granted. I admire those ahead of me that I always seem to be following in the footsteps of, and lastly, I see people who accidentally and briefly cross paths with me, seemingly without an end goal in sight, and I admire them for accidentally achieving what took me so long to purposely attain. Would I be happy if I reached all of my goals tomorrow? No, I just find more to chase. I think that I have to find solace in the journey itself. To imagine that others see me with as much admiration and respect as I have for them, and that long after I'm gone, what I've achieved can help somebody else to climb a little higher. Even if it's in something as trivial as Flash games.